Andreas went from making almost no money his first year with print on demand to selling over $580,000 in revenue last year and making over six figures in actual take home profit. In this interview, he'll share some of the biggest lessons that he had to learn along the way to help you get past those faster. And he shared some of the little changes that actually made a really big difference. And he actually recently started his very own YouTube channel that I'll link down in the description. So please take a moment to go subscribe and check out his brand new channel as well. So let's dive right in and start learning and let's say hello to Andreas. Welcome Andreas. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your journey on Etsy. I know everyone is so excited to hear from you. Thank you. I'm stoked to be here and it feels good to finally be able to do this with you. So yes, happy. always so fun to connect and yeah, excited to finally have you on to talk about your journey. So let's just dive right in, Andreas. I'd love for you to give us kind of a quick intro about you and your journey to finding print on demand, because this wasn't just always your dream, right? This was a vehicle to kind of get you somewhere else. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your beginning journey with this? Sure thing. So I mainly am a musician. That's the main thing that I've been focused on, focusing on my whole life. After some complications with a manager type person, I basically was in a position where I felt that I had to find some way to actually make money. So I stumbled, ac stumbled across YouTube and found some print on a man videos. I actually started a, a digital shop. So that was my first endeavor into Etsy print on a man. And then being a bit crazy as I am, I actually re reached out to you personally, Cassie, and you told me to start print on demand instead of doing a digital shop. So I, then I did print on demand and then I went ham in the beginning. I did 500 listings a month and I haggled you even more <laughs> to try it because I really wanted to learn from someone. So I haggled you to start a, me to start a, start a mentorship. Uh, it took about a couple of weeks to get my first sale and to get myself from the ground up but for quite a while I did like five to yeah about like five to 10k in revenue each month and that was I lived off of that because I went ballistic <laughs> I know I went guns blazing basically when it came to this I knew that I needed to do something else so I haggled you about starting a mentorship then you did and when I did that things really started wrapping up so I went from like five to 10k a month to without 20 percent net profit margin in just a span of a couple of months i went from 5 to 10k but i think i doubled and oh, yeah i'm pretty sure i doubled and tr then tripled my order value each month so instead of just doing 5 to 10k i was doing 15 to basically 30k each month and doing like regular months excluding q4 yeah i think that is a really great kind of ramp up of beginning and getting going and then ramping it up. And that's awesome. I know you said you went ham. 500 listings is a ton in a month. Let's start with what that actually looked like day to day. So what was your process? Like how many listings were you getting a day? What did that look like in the beginning compared to maybe how your process evolved? In the beginning, beginning there, I got to know about scalable designs. So I tried scalable designs. That was my main focus. I basically did 50 listings a day. So I did scalable design, just switch out some words to, for instance, if we do like teacher stuff, you can do, for instance, first grade teacher and then second grade teacher and just switch out a couple of words. And then you have a bunch of designs out quick. But 50 listings a day was my goal, basically. But I just knew that something I didn't click because uh, some YouTube videos was um, really going ham on that you need to list. And the process of doing quantity is super important to get good. A certain point, because I have, I have so many expired listings, uh, after a certain point, it's just not a good time spent. So I focused on working smart. I hated this in the beginning to hear working smart instead of hard, but I basically worked smart instead of hard. So I started learning from you, Cassie. The community that, it was, that, that, that you built within the mentorship was super valuable because you could just hear other people's struggles. And then from learning from what other people experienced, when that happened to me, I was already kind of ahead. So I knew what to do when stuff happened. The process was basically doing 50 listings a day until I kind of realized that I just need to revamp my store in order to grow. Not do more of the same, but to almost none of the same and just do a little bit stuff, stuff a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. So in the beginning, you were doing 50 listings a day and kind of just 
throwing things at the wall, but then eventually you learned that you needed to be a little bit more intentional with your listings, pay more attention to the details. And what were some of those details that you paid more attention to? Was it the research? Was it your pricing? What did kind of that kind of more fine tuned working smarter look like for you? In hindsight, what I basically did was that I just looked at a uh, I basically just I, I, I basically just just applied uh, what Alex Hermosi says. I'm a big fan of Alex Hermosi, but he talks a lot about the, val the value equation that he came up with himself, I think. But uh, I looked at my shipping times uh, to make sure that it was like if people are going into my listing that they're not receiving it in four weeks. So having competitive sh shipping times was one of the one big driver. During one Q4, I had almost no sales, and I was wondering why. And the main th the main reason for that was my shipping times. The shipping times was one of the big things that I changed. I increased the perceived likelihood of achievement by adding a guarantee into my listings. So having a, just a guarantee that takes off risk of the customer. Because in the beginning, we none of us have a lot of reviews and a lot of sales. So in order to make a customer feel more comfortable with their purchase, I basically inserted a guarantee to say that uh, if something happens, then they can have either a refund or a replacement. So those those two things uh, were, I think, one the two big ones. And what was your time frame for delivery before, and what did you end up changing it to? Just about, just curious, what kind of that difference was? Uh, I honestly don't remember, but I remember it was a bit too long because I think I had like one, two, seven in days in processing, and then probably maybe two to five or like, yeah, maybe two to five or two to seven business days in uh, delivery time. And that was way too long. Cause then it says basically that that is gonna arrive in almost four weeks. I think at least if I'm not miscalculating here. So yeah, when it comes to shipping times, having those accurate uh, with uh, Printify, which is my print provider that I use, uh, having those set in accordance to that was super important. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Obviously, you want to be quoting the correct timeframes that they can really expect. I know in the beginning, it's tempting to be, um, you know, like under promise, over deliver, you know, but a lot of times when people are buying presents, they want it by a certain date. And usually with print on demand, I'd say nine times out of 10, you can get the item to someone within like a week to a week and a half. So I don't think that is unrealistic to think that that's possible. So definitely a really good tip there. And I love the advice about the guarantee as well, especially when you're brand new, uh, people not trusting you because you don't have any reviews yet can be tough. So offering some kind of guarantee that if they're not happy with the item that you'll take care of it is really great call. But what has that looked like for you? Have you taken a lot of returns and exchanges? Because I know that people are really scared to offer things like that because it might lose them money. And I think we both know from reading Alex Ramosi's $100 million offers book that it the payoff is worth it. But what has the downside looked like for you, for anyone who might be scared to offer something like that? Yeah, the downside is basically taking returns and losing some. But here's the great part. If we have a good, if we have a good offer within our listing, I think my return rate or Basically, my default, my defect rate and return rate is about 1%. But the upside to having, for instance, a returns and exchange policy, I do have that in my store, is huge. Yeah, you just get so, so much more orders from that exchange policy. And you, you might have a few customers that returns it. But if your, or if your offer is set, you're like you have an accurate size chart, you, have on, you display everything in a, in a good way. You know that, for instance, you don't sell black writing on a black shirt. Or for instance, uh, you don't sell uh, maybe red ink on a red shirt, then you know that the customer will get what they actually see on the picture. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think offering returns and exchanges feels really scary. And it is sometimes annoying to get them because people have pretty silly reasons to get returns. You know, oh, I accidentally ordered two and I didn't mean to, you know. So then let's get into some more of the actionable steps that maybe people can learn from you because I think you have a really awesome story. You've worked really, really hard to build the business that you have. Uh, but in the beginning, that feels so far away and and so hard to get to. So you said that it took you a couple of weeks to get your first sale. Going back to that time, what did that feel like? And how did you kind of push through that? And what are some of the things that you did that you think got you that first sales? So for me, I had some savings saved up. 
I knew that I was going guns blazing. I needed to make this work. There's a good Tony Robbins quote where basically people, two, two rivalries went on an island and they kind of fought for this island, I think. Each party came by boat. And then one of the parties, uh, the leader there says, burn our boats. And they did. And then the leader said, if you want to go home, you have to take over the island so we can go home with their boats. And that's the kind of thesis that I went by. It's kind of going ham. I don't recommend it to anyone for sure, but uh, I don't have any kids. I only have my girlfriend and my cat. So uh, I was in a position position where I could do that, where I also have like six months saved up. Going ham basically meant that I have to make this work. And that's also why I kind of went to talk to someone called Cassie on, on the web. <laughs> so my biggest recommendation is basically have something that makes you for me, at least, having something that that made me really focused to having to make it work was one of the biggest things that actually made it work. But let's dive into maybe some more of the specifics. If someone wanted to kind of replicate the success that you found, what types of products do you sell in your store? So I do a, a couple of different, th different things. I believe in, in just, if you have a, because my approach, basically, there's different approaches to this. But if I have a design that sells on one thing, it could probably sell on another. For instance, if I sell something on a mug, for instance, it usually doesn't sell as good on a t-shirt and vice versa. So uh, mugs, for instance, and uh, t-shirts are stuff that I sell. But I try to broaden myself as much as possible just to try different products all the time, but based on data. Okay, so you've tried some different types of products over time, but the t-shirts and mugs are what you've found kind of most of your success with. Those are definitely my biggest sellers for sure. Okay, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And what has that looked like for you niche-wise? Do you have a niche store where you sell mainly just one niche in your store, or have you kind of gone more the general niche route where you've sold lots of niches? So I tried a bunch of different things, but I'm still a Cassie alumni. So um, I've definitely gone the general store way. My whole thesis was that I, I'll have to get your results and then I can iterate uh, on that. But I have to learn f from you. So and from the when I have like those results, then I can iterate. So I don't want to talk about specific niches, but I basically use every bit to research. I've tried a bunch of different things. So uh, I do I do I add some niches, but my main thesis now uh, where I am at the moment is that based on my own data, I, I have my own set of niches that I know are selling re really well that I'm kind of getting established in. And then I can just add new stuff to those niches that I'm already in. Yeah, that's where I'm now. But in the, in the beginning, I was just trying different things based on basically based on, on what you taught me. So I tried to do teachers, nurses, I tried to do what else I did a lot of Christmas stuff in the beginning, I get so much Christmas stuff at the beginning, and nothing worked in the beginning. Uh, but I basically tried just a bunch of different things until I find found something that worked. Yeah, so it sounds like when you first get started, try quite a few different niches just to find what works best for you. And then when you start finding success in a niche to really double down in those niches and make different versions, do sub niches or cross niches and really kind of dive deeper into those ones. And so I think it is interesting that the process in the beginning can look very different than it does you know, in the end. And I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, when you're starting to build your business, it's so much learning, it's so much grinding, it's so much work, but it doesn't look like that forever. And I think that's really cool because looking at the results that you had in your store last year, Andreas, why don't you tell us a little bit about how much you sold last year and maybe how that has kind of changed things in your life? So last year I sold $580,000. Uh, on Etsy with about a 5% conversion rate. And what that basically means is that you don't have to do that much work if your con conversion rate is high. Because you can just, for instance, there are shops that have like 20 listings. I'm not saying that everyone should list 20 stuff and expect 600K in a year. But I mean, you can have less listings with a, a high conversion rate and that can make up for a big amount of revenue. Yeah, I think there's a lot to learn there. So in the beginning, you're kind of shooting everything against the wall, you know, seeing what works. But then as you start to find success, you refine and refine and refine. And eventually you don't have to work quite as often because what does that look like these days for you? I know in the beginning you were doing like 500 listings a month and that can feel like such a grind and so much work. But I know that's not exactly what it looks like for you today. Yep. So for, for 
at the moment, I'm basically working one to two hours a day on Etsy. That's all really I do. And then I have a new YouTube channel that I'm trying to learn about and trying to grow. So uh, I spend my most of my time doing that. And then apart from that, doing some music stuff. But uh, yeah, when it comes to Etsy, it's basically one to two hours a day. That's amazing. And you said of that 580K that you sold last year on Etsy, about what percentage of that was actual take-home profit after all expenses for you? Because obviously that's the number that people really love to hear about. For sure. Uh, roughly, it's basically 20%. It's 21 or 20%, but roughly 20%. So basically yeah. six figures. Yeah, six figures is not bad. And what were kind of some of the expenses that went into that? Because I know a lot of people um, wonder about, say, like running ads. Is ads something that you've used a lot in your store? Or what are some of the expenses that you pay for to make that uh, all work together? Ads is a huge part of my strategy. Uh, Steven from Hell Custom, that also has a YouTube channel, his ways, I implemented a lot of his uh, teachings last year, and he is a big proponent of ads. So I spend about, what is it? I think it's uh, like my gross margin when I sell something is around 30 to 40%. I think it's around that at least. But my net margin for sure uh, is because uh, I base that on my accounting, but that's about 20%. But when it comes to Etsy ads, it's about, I think, 11 9 to 11% is my ad cost of my revenue. So basically, uh, of, of my gross profit, of my revenue that I make, 9 to 11%, I think, was my uh, ad cost for the, um, for the ads. And then after that, I have my take-home margin. Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. So if you were to give us some actionable takeaways of if you were starting back over with ads today, what are some of the advice that you'd give someone trying to get started with ads to find success with those? Yes. So one of the biggest things is that I think Etsy has really mislabeled the what a budget really is because it feels like if you put like a X amount or like $500 per day, it feels like it's going to spend that like with Facebook ads. But when it comes to Etsy, it's pay-per-click. So if no one is clicking on the on the uh, Etsy ad, then you don't pay anything. That also means that we can have a really high ceiling. The ceiling is basically the budget. So we can have a ceiling of like $1,000, which is the max. And then uh, we can give us ourselves the highest likelihood of just boosting listings. So the, the, the biggest tip that I would basically give someone is that don't be afraid to use it. If no one is basically clicking the ad, then you don't pay for anything anyways. But I would also have a big caveat to that, which is if the SEO isn't super targeted, like for instance, if we sell a flamingo shirt, but it says bird shirt, then it kind of confuses the Etsy algorithm because then you will also be advertised on bird shirt. And if people look at bird shirt, and they click your listing, you pay for that. So if the SEO isn't correct and it's not super targeted towards the thing that you're actually selling, then it can be costly, but not if you're targeted towards the niches that you're towards the thing that you're actually selling. So my biggest tip, tip is that if you're doing it, if we're doing Etsy ads, then we really got to be be super highly focused with our uh, with our um, SEO. So not include, for instance, if we sell a flamingo shirt, we sell a flamingo shirt, not a bird shirt. We only use flamingo within our title. And apart from that, it is don't be, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be afraid of, cause I was afraid of this in the beginning, but I wouldn't be afraid to have like a thousand dollars a day on my budget. I have that and I don't spend nearly as much as that now, but having that ceiling, if something, for instance, hits and kicks off, it gives a really, it can give a really good boost to a listing. And as long as our SEO is targeted, I would not be afraid to just have a good high ceiling on our Etsy ads budget. Yeah, absolutely. And what does that look like actually running ads? Do you run ads on every new product that you post, on only what's selling? Which listings do you decide to run ads on? So I basically run ads on my, this also comes from Steven from Hello Custom, his, his strategy. But when we basically list our items, we... Um, uh, oh, sorry, when, when I basically list my items, I can basically push them with ads. That basically gives them a higher likelihood of, set, of selling just because they are pushed out right away. So I list my items with ads on. And I do that until I spend about $10. 
when I've spent ten dollars, I can see if it it has hit the return on ad spend that I want. Then I keep it on. If it hasn't, I just turn it off. Okay, that's so that's about the threshold that you use. No, I think that's really actionable, really great. And I think a good reminder that Etsy ads aren't just a saving grace that if you just throw anything up on Etsy and run $1,000 a day in ads that you can get sales. I think Andreas really stressing the importance of making sure that your SEO is really tight. It's very specific. You know, if you really do your research on how to do SEO, look at what other successful listings have done, replicate that and make sure that if someone types something in, really think, am I going to be exactly what they're looking for when they type that in? And is there a good likelihood that if someone typed this into Etsy, would they click my listing and want to purchase it? And I think that's really important. But I don't think that's the only aspect. Obviously, there's your shipping times. There's your photo cards like we've talked about. I think one of the biggest things we haven't touched on just yet is the designs. You know, without a good design for the item, no one's ever going to click it or buy it in the first place. So I'd love to hear what that process has looked like for you for designs. You know, were you pretty great at designing in the beginning? Do you have any experience with design? Or what has that process kind of looked like for you over time to get good at designing things for what people actually want? So for me, I am a creative person, but I'm a musician. So when I started this, I couldn't do anything. I can barely draw a stick figure. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not a designer whatsoever. At least that, that's what I started in. But uh, when Cassie had her uh, stuff up on, up on Etsy, that really inspired me to see that, okay, she doesn't really know anything about designing as well, so I could probably do it too. And then if we just put a lot of work into it, I'll get better. And that's why I think it was a really good thing of me to actually do 50 listings a day, because then I did, I did so many designs that didn't work, but that led me to find a couple of designs that really worked. So... When it came to my process, I knew nothing about it. Uh, I got good over time uh, by just doing it, not knowing what I did, and then just trying to get better with, uh, like, with one step every day. So when it comes when it comes to designing, my whole thesis, my whole thinking about it now is, I try out as much. I, I try to find basically a proven design. So I try out a lot of designs. I take inspirations from stuff that has worked on Etsy. Like for instance, I did a video recently where I talked about that. Uh, I just I just scrolled through Etsy and found that like college varsity fonts are working super well. Also cur cursive fonts are working super well. So how I would have, how I would have done it better if I would have started now would basically be to just see what works there, combine the elements and find basically a, a proven design based on that research. So. To give an example, if a college font works and a cursive font works, then we can combine those and make a design out of that because we know that they work separately, but then we can combine them together and make something new. We never copy anyone. We just take inspiration from what, from what is actually working. We find the elements. We write a list on the elements that works, and then we just put two and two together. And no, and the Pareto principle still applies here. So in the beginning, I tried out a lot of different things, but the, when it comes to design, we just I just had to try out as much as, I, as much as possible to find a proven design that I can then add to a list of proven designs, basically. And so you, ha you find different maybe layouts, color combinations, um, fonts that you really like, that you know that work. And then now when you go into, say, a new niche or something, you already have an idea of what the designs are going to look like because you know these certain ones sell well on Etsy. Exactly. I treat this only as a business. This is not the creative outlet for me. So I know that, just like you said, I know that, for instance, this element works like this college font works. And then this cursive font works. I combine the two and see if they work together. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But then I try to find other elements that work as well. Just like you said, different color palettes. Yeah, just everything that could be in a design. Try to go combine one, two, and three, or one and two, and then two and one and just see whatever works. And then when something clicks, I just put that. I, and when something clicks, that would mean basically mean 10, three to 10 sales. And then something would click and that would basically write that up on a list called best selling designs. And then you have one there that you can just replicate into different niches. Yeah, no, I think that makes a ton of sense. It really seems like your success can all be boiled down to maybe two things from what I can really tell is 
doing the competitor research, taking a look at what's really working on Etsy, doing research on what works in business in general by doing things like reading the $100 million offers book by Alex Hermosi, um, joining my mentorship group to learn from other people and how they did it and you know, kind of compound on their success. So it sounds like there's been a lot of research a lot of learning so that you can be really intentional with your actions. But then also on your part, a lot of maybe A-B testing where you're trying different photo cards, you're trying different design styles, you're trying different niches, and then doubling down on what works from those results. Exactly. I learned the A-B, how important the A-B testing is when I did my Facebook uh, ad agency. Because uh, that's all you do with Facebook ads. You basically test. You basically just test, 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 test to find a winner. But yeah, testing is a big part. And then, but in in all due honesty, the most important thing is learning. Because uh, I could have probably achieved this result in four years if I did this all by myself, or five years probably. Because I had to figure. I had to go through. If I would have done it myself, I had to. Ha I would have had to actually go and find every roadblock and then find some way to go past that. But if, since I joined your, your mentorship, I heard that one person basically struggled with this and then another person struggled with that. I basically struggled with this. Then you could really relate to someone. You could really learn what everyone was going through. And from that, uh, you could really learn. So when something happened to the two, uh, to one person in the group and that then happened to me, I knew how to face it. But apart from that, you could also say, for instance, I'm not selling anything right at the moment. Why I'm not selling? Uh, and then you can get like ideas and bounce things back and forth in the small community that you that you basically made for us. So one the biggest takeaway in my opinion, and this is not in any way, shape, or form a plug, but it was it was actually the mentorship. I even am now paying for a super expensive course uh, on how to do YouTube because I don't know how to do YouTube. But I know that if I want to learn this fast, I can either pay this with time or I can fast track it with money. I will still have to pay it some time, but I can pay with less time and just some money to be able to fast track it. No, and I definitely couldn't agree more. I think, you know, I went through my own mentorship program with the Life Hacker couple when I first got started, and I found a lot of the really exact same benefits. And so when you asked me to create one, I thought it was a great idea. So I feel like we have a fun kind of intertwined story of kind of how things have gone for us. I'm really excited for you to be on YouTube and starting this journey now. And what I think is interesting is there's a lot of exact parallels. You have to do a lot of the same learning, a lot of the same A-B testing, you know, a lot of the same types of research. You know, any business that you start, really these skills that you're going to learn building your Etsy store can be applied. You know, the fact that you learn things from when you were doing Facebook ads, it kind of brought that to Etsy. All of this is business. And I think looking at it as anything else is going to give you a hard time. You know, like you said, you know, trying to like be unique or be creative with your designs. If it's not based on research, if it's not what someone is already looking to buy, then you're not going to get sales. And so I think that was really good advice to make every decision that you make for your business based on the research and not what you like or what you want to do. And it takes time. I mean, you didn't start making six figures a year right away, you know, and I don't think that's what you were expecting to do either. You know, obviously it'd be great if we all made six figures our first year on Etsy and print on demand, but most of us had to go through hours and hours and months and months of trying things and learning things to get where we are today. And so I think that this has been a super valuable interview, Andreas. I really am so glad that you decided to come on. But before we hop off, are there any other words of wisdom or helpful tips that if someone is maybe not getting the sales that they want, that you could give them to help them on their journey? If I had to boil it down to one thing, it's basically if your expectation is to make it work uh, as a business, then you have to treat it as a business. You can't treat it like a hobby and, and just do it do it once in a while. You have to make daily progress, in my opinion at least, and then you gotta base your base your decisions on data. I think that's really, really great, great advice. So thank you so much, Andreas, for coming on to join us. If you guys haven't already, check out Andreas's YouTube channel down in the link in the description. He's just posted his first few videos and is going to be making such valuable content and will give a great perspective, especially to anyone 
that doesn't live in the United States. Obviously, you give great advice to everyone, but I know living in the U.S. and selling to the U.S. is simple, uh, but I think you'll be able to give some really great advice, and you have a great video about VAT if that's something that you need to worry about. So go ahead and click and subscribe to Andreas's channel down below, and thank you so much, Andreas, for your time. Thank you for having me on, Cassie. It's been, it's been uh, awesome to be on, so thank you. I hope you love this interview with Andreas. I think some of the biggest takeaways for me when I was watching this was that you shouldn't be afraid to try out Etsy ads. I know they can be intimidating. This can be a great way to boost new listings faster and start getting more results back to know what you should make more of or make less of. The second thing that I think I'd really take away is that it takes a ton of hard work to build a print-on-demand business. In the beginning, it might look like making hundreds of listings doing hours and hours of research, but eventually when you find things that start working for you, it gets a lot easier and you get to just keep doubling down on what's working instead of having to always be going back to the beginning. So just know that the beginning is the hardest part, that actual building, but it does eventually get easier. Third is to really invest in your education, whether that's reading books, watching lots of YouTube videos, purchasing a course to become a part of a community of other sellers on the same path as you, or really just doing a ton of competitor research and being a student of Etsy, making sure you're paying attention to what works and how you can implement that into your own store. And I'll go ahead and I'll link my coaching program that I have available down in the description below that comes with a whole community of sellers on the exact same journey as you, just like Andreas was talking about. So if that seems like the right fit. I'll link that down below. But even if you don't, I hope you know that I am here rooting for you, that there are tons of other people out there on the same journey as you, and it's normal that it feels hard and that it takes time to build it. Nothing good ever comes easy, right? And just know that we are here rooting for you and that you can do this. And as always, thank you so much for watching all the way until the end, and I'll see you in the next one.